My name is Dale Jamieson. My background is in philosophy. I teach in the law school at NYU, as well as in the philosophy department in the Department of Environmental Studies. I work on problems ranging from climate change to lots of different kinds of issues about animal ethics and animal law. In the work that I'm doing now, the things that I'm most excited and most interested in that really directly bear on issues of animals and nature uh, one area has to do with conservation. And for so long we've had this slogan in conservation that animals have to pay their own way. I think that's an absurd idea. I don't think animals have to pay their own way on this earth any more than humans have to pay their own way. The question is really how to live peaceably with other animals on this planet. And I feel like I, this is a moment where there are a lot of partners in the conservation community and it's a time when we can start thinking about conservation in a new way that doesn't involve killing a lot of individual animals and compromising their welfare, but instead thinking positively about how we can live in these interspecies communities on a global basis. The other issue that I'm really interested in uh, is this issue of, the, of global meat consumption, because meat is sort of the time bomb that fossil fuels are in the climate change debate. And if we don't bend the curve on meat consumption, just as we don't bend the curve on fossil fuel consumption, then we're going to lose an enormous amount over the next few decades. And so I'm particularly interested in doing this work in China where I have some long-standing relationships and uh, some excellent collaborators. And also uh, we have a campus of NYU in Shanghai as well that provides a basis for us to do work that one couldn't do through the NGO community there. So there isn't exactly a body of data. In fact, I think one of the issues here is that people tend to assume that we know a lot more than we actually do in terms of data. Most of our, the statistics that we have about consumption, meat consumption, dairy consumption, and so on, especially in developing countries like China, is actually not very high quality data. So part of this project actually involves getting better data, both quantitative and qualitative data. But it also, um, is going to involve uh, a, a particular opportunity that we have in China that is, I think, in, sort of informed more by anthropological or historical or ethnographic understanding. Um, you know, there's this old part of the Hippocratic Oath, which is do no harm. And I think if we're going to try to make the world better, the first thing we need to do is to stop inventing new ways of doing harm. And China doesn't really have a long-standing tradition of beef and dairy consumption. So it's a place where you can actually hope that there might be change to forestall a certain kind of modernity striking China in, in this way. And the Chinese government is to some extent supportive of this. The Chinese government does have policies in place to try to reduce beef consumption in particular. In some ways, what interests me the most is how a certain community of discourse and research is starting to form around animal studies, animal law, and animal policy. And I think it's very important for us to try to figure out how this can be managed and can be developed so that we don't just recapitulate what's happened in the standard disciplines and academic subspecialties, but really make sure that this work really does bear on the issues that we care about and really does mobilize these different points of view and expertises. Well, I think the sort of big question in the room, uh, not just for animal law and policy, but for a whole range of issues, is how better to understand social change and, and how it happens. And there's a lot that can be learned laterally. There's a lot that we can learn in animal studies from environmental studies, from the history of civil rights movement in the United States and other countries, apartheid in South Africa, all these kinds of stories. So a kind of lateral data base, if you will, that really needs to be integrated and brought together. But then we need to do that with a sensitivity to the particular moment and the particular context in which we're working. I don't think most fields really operate that way. Most fields just tend to create their new silos and sort of dig 
ever deeper into that particular specialization. So I think this challenge of integration is every bit as great as the challenge of so-called new and deeper research. But I think the most important area is really around how change happens and how in a particular situation and in a particular context can we make change. If we do things right, we will have some kind of common basis of understanding that can help all of us on this diverse range of issues. So I have a very long-term project with Naomi Oreskes and Michael Oppenheimer um, on really trying to understand how this category of expert and expert knowledge actually gets created around particular problems and then how experts interact with each other and interact with decision makers, the kinds of questions they ask, the kind of information they develop and how all of this then gets applied. So we've done this work in the environmental area, we've done it around problems like ozone depletion and acid rain and the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which is something we have to look forward to in the not too distant future. And we've also collected data on National Academy studies and National Research Council reports. And we also now have postdocs who are involved in the current IPCC process. I think the reason this issue is important is we're living in a time in which expertise is not very well respected and scientific information is not uh, deployed as it should be deployed. And part of the problem is, in a way, we've overly glorified scientific expertise. We've tended to treat science as if it is the deliverance from the gods, and so when the gods stumble, then they become the object of contempt. And so I think a much more realistic understanding of expertise also goes with greater respect for expert knowledge.